is in Europe and cannot come to America. What is an O-1 visa? The O-1 non-immigrant temporary visa is for the individual who possesses extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics, or who has demonstrated a record of extraordinary achievement in the motion picture or television industry and has been recognized nationally or internationally for their achievements, according to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. The State Department's Foreign Affairs Manual provides a similar definition for consular officers. Sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> <clears throat> to obtain an O-1 visa, an individual must receive an approved petition from USCIS after documenting their ability and achievement. Then he or she must be approved for a visa at the U.S. consulate. However, Trump's administration policy often makes that no longer possible. On March 11, 2020, the Trump administration issued Presidential Proclamation 9993, which stated, quote, the entry into the United States as immigrants or non-immigrants of all aliens who were physically present within the Schengen area during the 14-day period preceding their entry or attempted entry into the United States is hereby suspended and limited. The Schengen area includes almost all European countries. On March 14th, 2020, a few days later, Presidential Proclamation 9996 extended a similar set of restrictions to cover England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland. A NAFSA resource contains a list of executive branch COVID-19 travel restrictions. The Presidential Proclamation PP152, or 10052, excuse me, issued on June 22, 2020, suspended the entry of foreign nationals on H-1B, L-1, and certain other temporary visas, but not O-1 visas, until at least December 31, 2020. <coughs> Excuse me. The proclamation extended PP-10014, which suspended the entry to the U.S. of most immigrant visa applicants. State Department reply on visa policy. Attorneys say clients applying for O-1 visas intend to quarantine for 14 days in a country not subject to the proclamations, yet are still being denied visas. That removes the possibility of a visa holder quarantining in a non-banned country before they enter the United States, which should be sufficient to gain entry. Is, the, is it the policy of the State Department to deny all O-1 visa applicants in the Schengen area? I asked the State Department. A State Department official replied on background and confirmed that O-1 visa applicants cannot get visas to the United States unless they qualified for a national interest exception, which relatively few would. To the extent that an O-1 applicant believes that he, she meets the exception requirements, the applicant can apply for an exception and consular offices will make the determination, said the official. The reason for the policy is the March 11, 2020, Presidential Proclamation 9993, travel ban for the Schengen area. On March 11, 2020, the President signed a proclamation suspending the entry into the United States of any foreign nationals who were present in the 26 European countries comprising the Schengen area during the 14-day period preceding their entry or attempted entry into the United States, said the official. After noting the measures were extended to the United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland, the official added, certain business travelers, investors, treaty traders, academics, and students may qualify for national interest exceptions under presidential proclamations. Qualified business and student travelers who have valid visas, or ESTA, Electronic System for Travel Authorization, authorization may travel to the United States even as PPs 9993 and 9996 remain in effect. Consular officers also continue to consider national interest exceptions for qualified travelers seeking to enter the United States for purposes related to humanitarian travel, certain public health and health care travel, and national security. Attorneys believe administration policy harms their clients in the United States. 
The statement from the State Department appears to confirm that the current position is not to issue visas to anyone who is subject to Presidential Proclamations 9993 and 9996, but does not qualify for a national interest exception, said Rita Sostrin, a partner with Sostrin Immigration Lawyers, LLP, in an interview. National interest exceptions are generally reserved for an exclusive group of frontline workers, and most visa applicants would not meet the standard. Sostrin believes the Trump administration has twisted the proclamation's purpose and is now simply enacting additional restrictions on immigration. The spirit of the proclamations is to limit the spread of COVID-19, not to refuse visas to qualified individuals. This will hit particularly hard O-1 visa applicants who have already been approved by USCIS as individuals ex of extraordinary ability, the highest legal standard, to work in non-medical, non-scientific fields like arts, culture, and entertainment, as they are uniquely to qualify for a national interest exception. Oh, I'm sorry, as they are unlikely to qualify for a national interest exception. The State Department published a few paragraphs on the national interest exceptions, but the wording is similar to the statement from the official above. Quote, I can't help but feel this is just another effort by the current administration to restrict admission, admission into the United States of even some of the world's most talented people, said Debbie Klopman, a Brooklyn, New York-based immigration attorney, in an interview. The travel bans were certainly, at least initially, motivated by strong public health concerns. This current policy appears driven by an anti-immigrant culture within the administration. Attorneys provided examples of recent O-1 visa refusals. A filmmaker was refused an O-1 visa at the U.S. consulate in Paris on August 4, 2020. My client is a highly accomplished filmmaker who has worked on numerous award-winning productions, said Rita Soster. USCIS approved his O-1 petition and he received, received a visa interview in Paris. He was planning to quarantine in another country, but the consular officer refused his visa after a short interview. There was no discussion of his qualifications or the merits of his O-1 eligibility, said Soster. It appears that he was simply denied because of the Schengen ban, although the reason listed was the proclamation that restricts H, L, and J visas. Number two, a Polish actress and singer of note was refused an O-1 visa on August 5, 2020, at the U.S. consulate in Warsaw. Debbie Klopman believes the visa should have been issued to her client. Proclamation 9993 is not a ban against visa issuance in Schengen area countries, she said. The consequences of a visa refusal or denial in such circumstances are significant. There is every likelihood she will no longer be able to obtain authorization to travel to the United States. A visa denial creates significant roadblocks to the applicant the next time he or she obtains, attempts to obtain a visa. An O-1 visa was refused to a material designer at the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt on July 28, 2020. The officer refused the visa simply stating that they would not issue the visa after, until after the Schengen area travel ban is lifted, said Christy Terskovsky, a Portland-based business immigration attorney at Hammond Neal Moore LLC, in an interview. The officer indicated that the only way the visa applicant could be allowed to travel is if the work is related to COVID-19 or if the applicant is married to a U.S. citizen. Well, these are two of several factors that can be considered for a national interest exception waiver, they are not requirements for visa issuance. <sighs> My current advice to a non-immigrant visa applicant is to travel to a non-travel ban country where the U.S. Embassy is open and processing temporary visas, says Debbie Klopman. They should document their arrival and their 14-day stay. An appointment should be arranged for visa processing at this non-travel banned country on or after day 15 following arrival. The applicant should then fly directly to the United States. She notes that transit through a travel banned country triggers the ban and the visa holder will be banned from traveling through the transit country to the United States. Christy, Christy Trufowski points out another problem with the Trump administration's policy and consular of officer refusals. 
These proclamations are bans based on a person's physical presence in an affected country within 14 days immediately preceding entry to the United States, she said. Yet the government is creating a hurdle for foreign nationals to later enter the United States even after the travel ban is lifted or after they make an intervening trip for at least 14 days in a country that is not listed within the proclamations. She says that refusing visas due to the proclamations is misguided. A visa is the stamp representing a travel document that allows a person to apply for admission to the United States. It does not guarantee admission to the United States, but allows the person to appear at the airport or land port of entry and be inspected. The consular officers should be issuing the visas, and it is the job of inspectors at ports of entry to decide whether to allow someone to enter the United States using that visa. Customs and Border Protection is the agency that may refuse someone entry if he or she is subject to the travel ban. If they have been in one of the affected regions during the 14 days before seeking entry to the United States. Donald Trump has spoken repeatedly about a merit-based immigration system that rings hollow and appears to just be a code phrase for less immigration when even people who meet the highest standards for obtaining a visa are refused. Opponents of immigration often have argued that if a foreign national was extraordinary, they could just get an O-1 visa. Like most such arguments, it is not true, particularly during the Trump years. Today, if Superman and Wonder Woman lived in Europe, it appears they would fail to possess enough extraordinary ability to obtain a visa to enter the United States. So, you know, again, I don't want to make too much of this extraordinary ability, highly skilled, etc., etc., but at the same time, these are not people you want to be turning away. It's not that they are less valuable because they have higher skills or anything like that. I just think it is important to level the playing field a bit when you're talking about skills or money or whatever, that that is not the, the deciding factor necessarily. But it certainly can be a factor that weighs in or on the balance in terms of deciding who should be allowed entry. And this notion that these people should be turned away simply because of some quirky twist in these presidential proclamations is ridiculous and uncalled for. Okay, so moving on, speaking of highly skilled immigrants, Kamala Harris, daughter of immigrants, is the face of America's demographic shift. When Kamala Harris's mother left India for California in 1958, the percentage of Americans who were immigrants was at its lowest point in over a century. That was about to change. Her arrival at Berkeley as a young graduate student and that of another student, an immigrant from Jamaica, whom she would marry, was the beginning of a historic wave of immigration from outside Europe that would transform the United States in ways its leaders never imagined. Now the American-born children of these immigrants, people like Ms. Harris, are the face of this country's demographic future. Joseph Biden's choice of Ms. Harris as his running mate has been celebrated as a milestone because she is the first black woman and the first of Indian descent in American history to be on a major party's presidential ticket. But her selection also highlights a remarkable shift in this country, the rise of a new wave of children of immigrants or second generation Americans as a growing political and cultural force, different from any that has come before. The last major influx of immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries came primarily from Eastern and Southern Europe. This time the surge comes from around the world, from India and Jamaica to China and Mexico and beyond. In California, the state where Ms. Harris grew up and which she now represents in the Senate, about half of all children come from immigrant homes. Let me read that again. In California, about half of all children come from immigrant homes. Nationwide, for the first time in this country's history, whites make up less than half of the population under the age of 16. 
the Brookings Institution has found. The trend is driven by larger numbers of Asians, Hispanics, and people who are multiracial. Today, more than a quarter of American adults are immigrants or the American-born children of immigrants. About 25 million adults are American-born children of immigrants, representing about 10% of the adult population, according to Jeffrey Passel, senior demographer at the Pew Research Center. By comparison, the foreign-born portion of the population is still much larger, about 42 million adults, or roughly one in six of the country's 250 million adults, Mr. Passel noted. At 55, Ms. Harris is on the older side of the second generation of Americans whose parents came in those early years, but her family is part of a larger trend that has broad implications for the country's identity, transforming a mostly white baby boomer society into a multi-ethnic and racial patchwork. Because of the influx of immigrants from outside Europe and their children, every successive generation in America in the past half century has been less white than the one before. Boomers are 71.6% white. Millennials are 55% white. And post-Gen Z, those born after 2012, are 49.6% white, according to William Frey, a demographer at the Brookings Institution. The demography is moving forward, says Marcelo Suarez Orozco, chancellor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, who has studied these modern children of immigrants from the Caribbean, China, Central America, and Mexico. This is the future in the U.S. The immigrants who arrived about 50 years ago, people from countries like India, China, and Korea, often had higher education but rarely went into politics. Their children, now middle-aged adults, are the ones moving into American public life. When my parents came, it was like, we just want to make it, said Suhas Suramayan, who was born to Indian parents in Houston, Houston, <laughs> in Houston, in the 1980s, and in 2019 became the first Indian American to be elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. But the second generation, we want to make our mark on the world. I wanted to do more than just work at a law firm and make money. I feel very patriotic about America. There were only about 12,000 Indian immigrants in the United States around the time Ms. Harris's mother, Shyamala Gopalan, arrived. Satish Korpe, an engineer who moved to Virginia in 1975, said that there were so few Indian immigrants in the state when he got there that there was not a single Indian food store, and people drove to New Jersey to buy groceries. In the mid-1970s, if you ran into someone who was American, you might have been the first Indian person they'd ever seen, he said. Then in the 1980s, maybe you could be the fifth, and in the 1990s, the tenth. These changes trace back to the passage of the landmark 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which abolished the quotas that were established in the 1920s to keep America white and Protestant. The 1965 law banned discrimination based on ethnicity in the immigration system and prioritized entry for people with relatives already in the United States and those with special skills. In addition to opening the door to many more immigrants from India, the law also ended a strict quota on the number of immigrants from the British West Indies. Previously, about only a hundred Jamaican immigrants a year were allowed into the country, and in 1960, around the time when Ms. Harris's father, Donald Harris, began to settle in the United States, there were fewer than 25,000 Jamaican immigrants in the country, according to the Migration Policy Institute. But it, by 2018, that number had increased to more than 733,000. Amber Simon's Jamaican mother came to the United States in 1984 at the invitation of an aunt. She eventually married a black man from Alabama, and Miss Simon, now 24, remembers growing up in Tampa, Florida, and feeling that her friends' houses were different. They did not take off their shoes or have the same kind of respect for their parents that was the rule in her Jamaican household. Her father taught her to conform to society and to try not to stand out, and he talked to her about the dangers of the police. But her mother, who lived in Jamaica until she was 15, had none of those views. Half of me grew up oblivious to the fact that I was a minority, and half of me was really conscious of it, said Ms. Simon, who began to write online about her thinking on race 
after the killing of George Floyd. She visited Jamaica for the first time last year and said she was stunned at how much it resembled her father's living circumstances growing up, deeply poor. But she also gained an even greater respect for her mother who, through force of will, completed her education is now and is now a project analyst for the federal government. I always say if my mom can overcome the obstacles she's faced as an immigrant, there's absolutely no reason I can't have the success that I dream of, said Ms. Simon, who is beginning an MBA program next month. There's no excuse for me not to be exactly where I want to be in life. In 1970, when Ms. Harris was growing up and the effects of the 1965 law were not felt fully yet, America was still mostly a country of black and white. Immigrants were less than 5% of the population. Ms. Harris's parents divorced when she was five, and her mother raised Ms. Harris and her sister as black girls because she knew American society would see them that way. My mother understood very well that she was raising two black daughters, Ms. Harris wrote in her book, The Truths We Hold. Navigating the, the divide between black and white can be difficult for the children of immigrants who are neither. Ghazala Hashmi, grew up in southern Georgia, in the only Indian family in her small town. Her father had brought the family there after finishing his doctorate in the late 1960s. We were a minority of one in our school always, said Ms. Hajmi, 56, who is now a state senator in Virginia. I never knew anybody who was like me. It was extremely isolating. Ms. Hashmi was in second grade when her school began to be integrated. She has clear memories of the awkward feeling of not fitting into a neat racial category in a country where people clearly wanted to put her into one. I was very conscious as a child of being neither black nor white, she said. The white children would not play with the black children, and apparently I could play with either. Sometimes I could mediate. It was very formative to be part of that as an immigrant and a child of the South. Eventually, more families came, and by the time her sister was born eight years later, there were more South Asian children to play with. Last fall, Ms. Hashmi, a former literature professor and a Democrat, flipped a state Senate seat in Central Virginia. The tagline for her campaign, she said, was, Ghazala Hashmi is an American name. I really needed people to understand that there was a more complex America that was growing, she said that my name was part of a new American identity that had been emerging for 40 years, and we just hadn't been conscious of it. These children of immigrants are mostly better off economically than immigrants. They earn more, are more educated, and are more likely to own a home, according to a 2013 Pew report, and they are more likely to marry a person of another race. Interracial marriages rates... Inter, inter, bleh, bleh, bleh. Try that again. Interracial marriage rates are especially high for second-generation Hispanics at 26% and among Asians, 23%, Pew found. The cultural cloud of immigrant families is set to grow even more given that America's population is now growing at its lowest rate since 1919 because of a drop in births and an acceleration in deaths. If current trends continue, 93% of the growth of the nation's working age population between now and 2050 will be accounted for by immigrants and their U.S. born children, she projected. They are also a growing political force. More than 23 million immigrants will be eligible to vote in the 2020 presidential election, Pew has found. That is roughly 10% of the nation's overall electorate, a record high. And because they and their children have tended to vote for Democrats, the political winds are shifting in states like Arizona, Nevada, Virginia, Georgia, and Texas. Ashu Rai grew up in the 1970s about 70 miles east of where Ms. Harris was born. Her town had a Sikh temple that was a gathering place for South Asians from miles around. As a child, she played on the grass outside and went to potluck suppers at people's houses after worship. But South Asians were still rare in her suburban life, and for a while as a teenager, Ms. Rye pretended to be Hispanic. It was just easier to assimilate rather than trying to explain what being from India meant, said Ms. Rye, whose Indian parents went to Wyoming in 1969 to earn postgraduate degrees before moving to California. 
Today, Ms. Rai, a Democrat, feels proud of her Indian roots. She works in healthcare marketing and organizes dance parties for LGBTQ South Asians. She badly wanted Ms. Harris to win the presidential primary, so when the senator was picked for the ticket this week, Ms. Rye was elated. My first word when I found out, I think it was a swear word, she said. I was like, she's got it. Now, I personally found that story interesting, of course, for its, um, you know, what it says about the country generally and about the, the current race for president. But also on a personal level, I was born in a biracial household, uh, second generation immigrant. And I can relate to a lot of this stuff too. It is very interesting for me anyway, to talk about race as a topic, because having grown up with more than one ethnicity, more than one race has made it very plain to me how most people see race as an either or thing. You're either white or black or Asian or something, you know, you're, you're, uh, Indian, you're Mexican, you're whatever. It, these are very distinct categories that people see each other in. And, um, growing up, straddling those categories is very, very interesting because you don't really fit anywhere exactly. There is no group that is you. I think that is changing to a certain extent. I think that will continue to change. And as we see the demographics change in this country and as more and more people become Not become, <laughs> you don't become something. Uh, as more and more children are born to these uh, multiracial, multiracial, multi multiracial uh, families, the the blended folks out there who just don't look exactly. I mean, are you? What are you? You know, I've I've had people ask me that. What are you before? I don't look particularly like anything now. I mean, I, I probably just look white to most people now, but I was a lot darker when I was younger. Um, and so I stood out more. And even to this day, even at this point in life, I've gone to like convenience stores, like say in, in uh, New York or places where there are more ethnic groups. Around here, there's not so much a, a thing, but in places where there are more distinctive ethnic enclaves, you know, it'll be like, oh, are you Albanian? Are you this? You know, people will ask me these things or they'll just kind of bond with me like, hey, you must be Italian or you must be this. They're always searching for some category to fit me into. And I think that's changing. I think as as the years go by, that is going to change to the point where being of mixed race will be a normal thing. And we'll, we'll have to come up with new ways to talk about race and new meanings for race, uh, what it is and, and, and what it says about you and new prejudices and new stereotypes. I'm like, oh, you're one of those and therefore you're like this. Anyway, I've run out of time. I've got to go, but I thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you later next time. Bye-bye.